Hello, and welcome to the University of Kentucky Transplant Center. I'm Michael Daly, the Surgical Director of Kidney and Pancreas Transplant here at the Transplant Center. You are here today for a kidney transplant consultation. The video will take you through the entire transplant process. Today, you will be introduced to your transplant coordinator. This person will be your contact person for everything you do in your transplant and will help you through the transplant process. Throughout your transplant experience, you may come in contact with many of the transplant team members, including, but not limited to, our transplant surgeons, advanced practice providers, nephrologists, coordinators, pharmacists, dietitians, social workers, and financial counselors. This multidisciplinary team meets once a week to discuss every patient that comes through clinic, any concerns or issues that may arise during the evaluation process, and to determine your candidacy for transplant. You will be thoroughly evaluated for candidacy for transplant. The United Network for Organ Sharing has specific criteria defining who may and may not be listed for kidney and kidney pancreas transplant, which we will review with you. We regularly review the candidate selection criteria for our program to be sure it is up to date and with current best practice. There may be health-related issues that would make it unsafe to perform a transplant. We hope that none of these apply to you. However, if they do, we will be discussing them with you personally during your appointment. These issues may include medical, social, or financial concerns. In some cases, patients may choose the transplant is not for them, or the multidisciplinary team may decide that they are not a candidate for transplant or the patient may still be working through the evaluation phase while their kidney is failing. In these cases, there are all alternative therapies to transplant. For those experiencing kidney failure, your nephrologist may treat you with hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. While this is ongoing, it will be important to remain in the best physical shape possible, staying active and working with your doctors to manage any chronic medical conditions, such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. After your initial clinic visit, the Transplant Multidisciplinary Committee will meet to discuss if you qualify to continue with the evaluation testing phase of the process. Sometimes dialysis is a better, safer treatment than transplant. This is often the case when patients have other health problems or if they cannot care for themselves at home. If it is felt that you are not a candidate at this time, your coordinator will send you a letter in the mail explaining why you're not a candidate. You will also get a phone call and have the opportunity to have your questions answered. Sometimes patients may need to meet a certain goal to decrease surgical risk and increase the chances of a positive outcome prior to starting the evaluation phase. If this is the case, you will receive a letter in the mail that explains what goals must be met within the next year to move forward to the evaluation phase. Your referral is open for one year from today's visit. If you do not complete the evaluation phase within that year, you will need to be re-referred so that your medical information can be updated. If the multidisciplinary committee decides that you qualify for the evaluation phase of the process, we will begin your testing and consultations. The evaluation phase will tell our team if you are a transplant candidate. During the evaluation process, you will meet with many team members. You will have a social work evaluation. You need to bring your support person to this appointment. The social worker will need to discuss the caregiver responsibilities and obtain a verbal consent from your support person in order for you to be cleared. You will also talk with our dietitian, financial counselor, and pharmacist. It is your responsibility to send in your general health screenings that are performed by your primary care doctor, referring doctor, or dialysis center. These items include mammogram and pap smear for women, prostate cancer screening for men, and colonoscopy if you are over 50 years old. You will also need a pneumonia vaccine. Your coordinator will provide you with a list of items that you will be required to submit as part of your evaluation. We will schedule the remainder of your testing in our center, unless you indicate a desire to have these tests performed closer to home. Any testing that you request to be performed locally will need to be ordered by your local doctor. We will provide you with a list of required testing and billing letter. However, you will be responsible for getting the results to your coordinator once the testing has been completed. Testing will be ordered to check your major organs and systems. It is important that we make sure that your other major organs are healthy and that you are free of infections and cancer. We will evaluate your lungs with a chest x-ray and possibly a breathing test. We will perform a cardiac stress test and echocardiogram to evaluate your heart. Sometimes we may need to consult a cardiologist. We will do blood flow testing, which may include an abdomen and pelvic CT scan, ultrasound of neck arteries, and ultrasound of leg arteries. 
We will also perform blood tests to check your kidneys, liver, and immune system. Depending on your health history, we may need to add more tests or consult with a specialist. Please let your coordinator know if you have had any of these tests performed in the past year. We may be able to use those results and not repeat the testing. Included in the blood work that will be performed will be a drug and nicotine screen. We may not move forward with your evaluation if either of these tests is positive for a non-prescribed drug. If one of these tests comes back positive, your coordinator will review our nicotine and or drug policy with you. Also included in your blood work will be blood typing, HLA typing, and antibody typing. HLA typing is a very important part of the transplant evaluation. Our immune system naturally forms antibodies as a protective response against bacteria and viruses. Antibodies are good when they are ready to attack foreign invaders that can lead to illness, but antibodies can also be ready to attack foreign tissue such as a new kidney transplant. Having a high number of different antibodies can mean that you are at high risk of rejection if you receive a transplant from a certain kidney donor. If you have antibodies against your particular kidney donor, the cross match will likely be positive, meaning that transplant with that donor would be a high risk for rejection. Antibodies are measured by a percentage. If your antibodies are more than 20%, UNOS now gives you extra points on the waiting list. Points are then translated into extra waiting time, which pushes you further up the list. If your antibodies are 99%, you will have regional priority, and if they are 100%, you will have national priority. Once you have completed all requested testing and consults and have turned in your primary care items, your case will be discussed in our weekly selection committee. Our multidisciplinary committee will discuss all of your evaluation results. There are three possible outcomes from this discussion. One, you are a candidate for transplant, which means you will move on to the listing phase. Two, you are not a candidate for transplant at this time, in which case your coordinator will contact you to inform you and will mail you a letter with the committee decision. Three, you need more tests or a visit with a specialist, and your coordinator will notify you of our concern and schedule these items for you. Once the committee decides that you are a candidate for transplant, you have two possible options for transplant, live donation or deceased donation. Both require that you be placed on the waiting list. When you are on the waiting list, it is important that the transplant center can get in touch with you at a moment's notice. You must provide us with correct phone numbers for yourself and as many family members or friends that you can provide. If you receive an organ offer and cannot be reached, you will be skipped and we will have to discuss your eligibility to remain on the waiting list in our multidisciplinary committee. It is also important that you update your coordinator with any changes in your health. If you are sick, it is important to tell your coordinator as a transplant may not be a safe option until the issue is resolved. This includes hospitalization, blood transfusion, a foot ulcer, or any health issue. If you change your phone number or address, you need to let the coordinator know, as this can affect our ability to notify you of important appointments or transplant opportunities. It is also important to notify us of changes in your insurance. If you do not notify us about insurance changes and come in for transplant, you could potentially be required to pay out of pocket for the transplant. If in doubt, call your coordinator. As a transplant patient, you have the right to be listed at as many centers as you would like. This may increase your chance of receiving a deceased donor transplant. It is only a benefit, however, to list at multiple centers that are in separate local areas. For example, you would not need to list at UK and Jewish Hospital in Louisville because we are in the same local area. This means that our waiting lists are combined when a local donor organ is offered. You may benefit by going to another area, such as the Cincinnati area, Tennessee, or Indiana. Please keep in mind that if you decide to be listed at multiple centers, you will be required to go through the evaluation process at each center and keep up with each center's requirements for listing. One major reason that patients usually decide to pursue multiple listing is being highly sensitized or having high percentage of antibodies. If your antibodies are above 20%, your coordinator will discuss this with you and may suggest multiple listing at another center. Some centers offer something called desensitization for patients that have a lot of antibodies. Due to the fact that desensitization increases the risk of rejection, we do not perform this procedure here at UK. Furthermore, if you choose to go through desensitization at another center, it may impact your listing with us. Please notify your coordinator. 
Live donation should always be your first priority due to improved outcomes. Live donor transplants tend to have better outcomes and the transplant itself tends to last longer for many reasons. Some of those reasons come from the fact that, one, a live donor has to be very healthy and have virtually no risks of kidney disease later in life. Two, the transplant can be performed once the donor is approved, which decreases your waiting time and will mean that you are likely in better health for transplant. And three, there is very little time that the organ is outside of a circulating blood system because your donor is in the next operating room while you are getting ready for surgery. Our deceased donor waiting times are unpredictable in the UNOS kidney allocation system and are currently several years. By obtaining a live donor, you can be transplanted much sooner. The sooner you receive the transplant, most likely the better your outcomes will be. It is well known that the longer you are on dialysis, your life expectancy goes down and more complications can arise. It is in your best interest to be transplanted as quickly as possible if you are getting close to or are on dialysis. Live donation allows you and your donor to schedule your surgeries when you are both in the best possible condition for your surgery. If a live donor presents themselves and you may think they may not match or may have something that keeps them from being a donor, still encourage that person to call. If it's a matching issue, we can discuss with them if they would be interested in the Paired Exchange Program. In this program, we match patients who have live donors approved that do not match them to others in the same situation. This is a way of still getting the benefit of a live donor even if your donor doesn't match you. Never rule out a potential living donor on your own. This can be a complicated process. Always have them call. As mentioned, a living donor should be everyone's first priority. If a live donor transplant is not a possibility, the backup plan is the deceased donor waiting list. A deceased donor is someone who has had a major injury or illness that is not survivable. Individuals may register as an organ donor or their families may consent to organ donation. The waiting list for deceased donors is long, and donated organs are a limited resource. Once the committee has reviewed your evaluation and you have been approved for listing, you will automatically be placed on the UNOS National Waiting List for a deceased donor. If you are not on dialysis, your waiting time will start the moment you are placed on the waiting list. If you are on dialysis, your waiting time will backdate to the day you started regular dialysis. You can be placed on the waiting list as an active or inactive status. Active means that you are healthy, ready for transplant, and could receive a call at any moment. Inactive means something is going on that makes transplant impossible at the moment. It may be a safety factor where you have an infection, cold, flu, or recent hospitalization. The medications we use can make the condition much worse so it would not be safe to receive a transplant if you have an active infection of any kind. Another reason you may be made inactive is traveling more than five hours from the transplant center. Transplant is very time sensitive. UK requires that you must be within five hours of the transplant center to be listed active. If you are placed on the inactive list, you are still on the waiting list and still gaining waiting time. The only time you are taken off the list is if you hear the words removed from the waiting list. Patients sometimes get inactivation and removal confused, so we like to stress that the inactive status is temporary and can be changed to the active status once the concern is corrected. The kidney transplant list is very complex. There are many rules that govern the order on the list. A new list is run for each donor and your place on these lists may vary slightly. While time on the waiting list remains very important, it is not the only factor. Other important factors on the waiting list have to do with donor criteria. Donors come in all shapes and sizes. Some of them are old. Some of them have medical problems. Sometimes they even have kidney disease. We will be evaluating each of these donors' kidneys for suitability for transplant. Kidney function declines with age. When a donor is particularly old, it may not be reasonable to use their kidneys to transplant a younger person. One of the questions we will be discussing today is whether you would be willing to accept the kidney from an older donor. If you are young, this may not be in your best interest, except under special circumstances. If you are older, this may allow you to cut in line in front of some younger people and save you some time to transplant. 
We will only use these older donors if we feel the kidney will last long enough to help you out. Sometimes, these donors have engaged in behaviors that increase the risk of them becoming infected. We worry these infections could be transferred with the transplanted kidney. Fortunately, our ability to detect these infections, such as HIV or hepatitis C, has gotten very good. We can now find very small amounts of these infections in the donor blood, if they're even present. Generally, what this means is that if the donor has been in the hospital for more than several days, we can usually find these viruses if they are present. There remains, however, a very small risk of transmitting these viruses. Because of that, we will only offer these organs to patients who are willing to consider this small risk. The risk is generally considered to be much less than the risk of dying on dialysis, so I encourage you to consider them. We will be able to discuss this with you at length if you are interested in learning more. If you are receiving a live donor transplant, you will come to the transplant clinic one week before your scheduled surgery date. You will meet with the surgeon, have a final cross match performed, and go to a pre-op anesthesia appointment. The night before your surgery, the operating room staff will call you with instruction on what time you need to arrive the following morning for your surgery. The deceased donor transplant process is very different. If you are active on the UNOS National Deceased Donor Waiting List, you could receive a call any time, day or night. When that call comes, a coordinator will ask you some questions over the phone to make sure there are no major contraindications to transplant. If everything sounds okay, the coordinator will instruct you to come to UK Hospital where you will be sent to a hospital room. At this time, it is important to have your blood drawn as soon as possible. This blood will be used to perform the cross match. The cross match tells us if you match the donor. If you do not match, we would have to send you home because you would reject the organ. Sometimes we call two patients for one organ in case the first person in line for the transplant does not match. We will always inform you when we call if you are going to be the backup patient, which means there is at least one person in front of you for this transplant. If you match, are the first person on the list for the transplant, and the organ is in good condition, you will be taken to the operating room. If the organ is not in good condition, the transplant will be canceled. This can happen at any time up until the transplant is complete. Once the surgery is finished, you will wake up in the recovery room and then be transferred to the transplant floor. If there are complications, or if you receive a kidney and pancreas transplant, you will go to the ICU to be monitored more closely before moving to the transplant floor. Most patients that receive a kidney-only transplant are in the hospital for an average of four to five days. During this time, you will be receiving a large dose of immunosuppression medication, which means that you are at high risk for infection. While you are in the hospital, the entire team will be teaching you how to take care of yourself, take your medications, prevent infections, monitor for cancers, and other important ways to care for your transplant. Once it is deemed safe, you will be discharged to your home. Now comes the good part, the transplant surgery itself. If you've made it this far, it's because you've been evaluated and discussed, you've been listed, you've received an acceptable kidney donor offer and come into the hospital, you are not currently ill, and you have a compatible cross match. Now that seems like a lot, you're right. It's pretty tricky to get this far, but if you do, it's time for surgery. There's generally one more opportunity for you to ask your surgeon any last minute questions. Because of confidentiality laws, we may not be able to tell you everything about your donor. We will tell you what we can. Before surgery, you will be taken to the preoperative holding area where you will meet with your anesthesiologist. When an operating room is available, they will take you to it and put you to sleep. We commonly also require a deep line in your neck, an arterial line in your arm, and a Foley catheter in your bladder. All of these will be placed while you are asleep. We then prepare your skin for surgery and start the operation. The kidney will be placed in your lower abdomen. We will not put it where your old kidneys are because the ureter or urine tube will not reach. We will sew the kidney blood vessels to the blood vessels of your leg. We will then sew the ureter to your bladder. When we are done, we will let the rest of your organ sit on top of it, which will hold it in place. These organs sitting on top of the kidney is part of the reason we may require some weight loss from some of our obese patients. 
We know that significant obesity decreases the likelihood that these kidneys will work right away, or even at all. Some of the theories behind that are transplanting obese patients is more complicated and it takes a longer time to sew in the kidney. Another theory is that the weight of the organ sitting on top of the kidney affects its blood flow. Either way, we may require some weight loss. While we are sewing the kidney onto your bladder, we will be assessing it. Because the bladder can stretch, becoming much bigger when it is full or smaller when it is empty, and the ureter cannot, where we connect these two together is prone to leak. Because of that, I will ask you to leave your Foley catheter in for several days after the transplant. How long depends on how healthy your bladder is. You should plan on being in the hospital for four days, although that can vary quite a bit. You will be in a private room and your family will be welcome to join you. By the time you leave the hospital, you will have a pretty good idea of how to take care of yourself and your new transplant. Once you're discharged, you can expect to have follow-up visits in the transplant clinic twice a week for the first few weeks. If everything is stable with your visits, you will then be moved to once a week and every other week thereafter. This is where your support person comes into play. Your support person will be responsible for bringing you to clinic visits, helping you manage your medications, and helping you with activities of daily living, such as laundry, grocery shopping, and household chores. The risk of rejection and infection are the highest during the first three months after transplant. Therefore, it is important that we monitor you closely. In addition to your lab work, we will also be monitoring you for side effects from your medications. Common side effects include hand tremors, diarrhea, and changes in your electrolytes or blood counts. At three months, we will automatically schedule you with your referring physician and will begin to alternate appointments with them. You should expect to always be followed by the transplant center so that we can monitor your kidney function and adjust your immunosuppression to optimize your outcomes from the transplant. Rejection is a major complication after transplant. To try and prevent rejection, it is very important that you never miss a medication. Your medications are your lifeline to your transplant. By missing medications or not taking them on time every day, you increase your risk of rejection. It's also very important to attend all doctor visits and lab appointments. With a transplant, we have lowered your immune system. This means that your body may not show significant signs of infection or rejection until the process is very advanced. Our goal is to pick up on rejection or infection in your lab work before you ever show signs or symptom. If you do not have your labs drawn or come to clinic as ordered, you are putting yourself at an increased risk of complication. Rejection can be acute or chronic. Acute rejection happens suddenly and often is not associated with symptoms. It is commonly found on regularly scheduled lab work and can often be treated effectively if caught early. Chronic rejection is a gradual increase in your creatinine over time. There is no treatment for chronic rejection and eventually the organ may fail, requiring either retransplant or dialysis. After transplant, you have staples in your abdomen. These will be removed in clinic once the provider feels that your incision is healed well enough. You will also have a ureteral stent in place. It is important that this is removed after transplant so it does not become infected. You will be given a urology appointment to have this removed, usually about five weeks after your transplant. Due to your immunosuppression medications, you will be at higher risk for cancers as our immune system is responsible for protecting against cancer. 50% of transplant patients will develop at least one skin cancer after transplant. It is important to monitor your skin monthly on your own, protect against burning, and see a dermatologist yearly after your transplant. You will also need to make sure you are doing your general cancer screenings, such as mammogram, pap smears, prostate exams, and colonoscopies, per general guidelines. Your primary care doctor is responsible for these tests since the transplant team does not follow them after transplant. Dental care is also very important after transplant to prevent infection. Wow, that was a lot. Thank you for watching and for your interest in transplant at the University of Kentucky Transplant Center. We hope this video was helpful. Please feel free to ask questions at any point during your visit. We want this to be a pleasant and informative experience for you. Please let us know if there's anything that we can do to assist you in your journey to transplantation.